Hello everyone and welcome. The topic of presentation today is on the sound tracker and how it would make verification simple. As a clinician, we are always faced with the dilemma that how many times do a patient need to come back and see us, you know? And from a practicing standpoint, the fewer times we can see a patient, the more patients we can see, and that's actually a good thing. If you look at some of the research data uh, that is out today, one very important characteristic that we see is that highly successful hearing aid fittings are characterized by fewer patient visits, meaning the fewer times the patient needs to come back and see you, the more likely is your fitting become very, very successful. And I think that's a very important thing, especially in this very busy uh, uh, clinical uh, environment. So as a practicing clinician, the question that you would ask yourself is, what is it that I can do to reduce the number of patient visits and still maintain the satisfaction that the patient has uh, for us? And to get at that answer, I think it's very important to recognize that if you can do it right the first time you see the patient, then that will be a wonderful thing, okay? And indeed, the question that we will ask ourselves is, well, if that is the case, what do we need to do to get it right the first time? A very important piece of evidence that was shown to us, you know, from Sergey Kochkin's report is, if you do verify and validate your fittings, if you do that, then it's very likely your fitting would be successful. Let me give you a little bit of background. There was a study published by Sergey Kochkin uh, in the June issue of the hearing review back last year, 2011. And in that particular study, 788 hearing aid wearers were surveyed. They were surveyed, they were given a survey to see how their clinicians do in terms of the way they fit the hearing aid. Of those patients, you can see approximately 36% of those patients said their clinician actually did verification on the, on the fitting, and they also did validation on the fitting. That's a very good thing. So about one third of those clinicians actually do that. Of those people, only about 34% uh, did the validation, and 9% do the verification, uh, but about 22% of these clinicians did not do anything. Okay, they simply put the hearing aid on the patient and the patient goes home uh, and all that uh, uh, kind of things. Uh, and what is very interesting to find out is of those patients who actually had the clinician do the verification, do the validation, these patients here were actually 20% more satisfied with the hearing aid fitting than the clinicians who did not do any verification and validation. And that is very important. It shows that if you do verification and, and validation, you are more likely to be happy with the hearing aid. That's one very important thing. The second very important thing uh, that this study was telling us is this. Sergey Kochkin also looked at the number of visits these patients um, uh, have to make uh, to complete the whole fitting process. And of those patients who also had verification and validation done on them, the average number of visits is about 2.1 visits. So these patients come back 2.4 times to make sure that the hearing aid was done fine and all that. Uh, there, the patients who had only validation done, they have a return of 2.55. So they come back 2.55 times. Whereas for those patients who did not have verification, did not have validation, these patients actually visited the clinician 3.57 times, okay? What that is saying is that for the patients who did not have the clinician do the verification, did not have the validation, they returned 1.16 times more than those patients who really didn't, uh, who, than those clinicians who actually have done the verification and the validation, uh, and a savings of quite a dramatic amount. So how would that translate into number of hours, you know, in terms of uh, uh, how, how that would help the clinician? Sergey Kochkin argued 
that in 2010, let's assume that we have like 2.5 million hearing aids sold, sold to 1.7 hearing aid wearers. And assuming each one of these visits is about 45 minutes, that actually translates to 391,334 hours. So then we say, okay, verification is important. We need to do verification. The question then is, well, can't we simply verify doing coupler measurements? Since couplers are devices that you can actually see the output of a hearing aid. And that, of course, is true. Okay? You can actually verify it with coupler type measurements. But the question really is, well, do what we see on a coupler reflects what the patient has within the ear canal? And that is why. And, be, uh, and, and because the changes in the ear canal size and so forth, that is why Sergey Kochkin said, well, if you do want to verify, you really need to verify with real deer measurements, with real deer system, which brings us to the point. So why do we need to do that? And again, it's primarily because of the differences. So how do we do real deer measurements? Uh, this is a typical output graph of a real deer measurement system. And if you look at this here, what happens in a real deer measurement system is you put a probe mic into the person's ear and then you present a sound to make sure that you can determine the threshold. So you present a very soft sound until the patient raises his hand, then you mark it as a threshold point. Okay, say for instance over here. And then you present another frequency, uh, then you mark the threshold, you present a third frequency, you mark the threshold and so forth. So for every frequency that you present, you mark the softest level where threshold occurs, and you measure the sound pressure in that ear. So this is the in situ threshold of the patient's ear canal, as you can see here. Then what you do is you present another sound, a fixed sound, say at a conversational level, and so forth. You present that sound and measure the real deer output of the hearing aid inside that ear canal. And this is typically represented uh, by this particular curve uh, that you see uh, over here. So, and what you do in real deer verification system, you first of all make sure that the output of the hearing aid matches a particular target. Okay, so if it matches a particular output target, then it is a good thing. If it is not, then it is not uh, quite as good. And the second, perhaps a very important thing uh, that we do is to make sure that the output of the hearing aid is actually above the in situ threshold of the patient. Okay? And the difference between the output and the threshold of the patient is the sensation level or how much that sound is above the hearing loss of the patient. And of course, a positive sensation level means the patient can hear the sound, whereas if these points are below the threshold of the patient or a negative sensation level, that means the patient cannot hear the sound. That, of course, is not a very good thing. So when we are doing real deer measurement, we are actually doing two things, matching a target and estimating if there is a positive sensation level, if people can actually hear the particular sound. So, so that's the rationale behind real deer measurement. So if you think about that, you say, well, wow, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. So why are we not doing more of that? To a certain extent, we are. Okay? Widex has actually considered all that real deer measurement uh, and the concept of the sensation level, we simply express it in a different way, and, and that is through the measurement of the sensogram and through the use of the sound tracker uh, system. Many of you recognize, many of you are very familiar with the concept of the sensogram. The sensogram is simply the in situ threshold, meaning the threshold of the patient's hearing with the hearing aid in the patient's ear. You all know that. Uh, and this is conducted in the same way as you do the audiogram. You test the threshold at 500 hertz, 1,000 hertz, 2,000 hertz, and 4,000 hertz. Uh, and it's very quick to do. And the studies that we have done has shown that this is actually a very reliable way of determining the person's hearing level 
with the hearing aid in the person's ear. The good thing about doing this is that it is a very reliable way of estimating threshold because you have considered all the variabilities associated with the individual's ear canal. The ear canal size is taken care of, the venting effect is taken care of, uh, the impedance difference is taken care of. So the magnitude of the sensogram actually tells you what is the ear canal seeing with this particular hearing aid in the person's ear. So it's very accurate from that perspective. Now, the important thing from the fitting standpoint is we take that number to specify gain on the hearing aid. So if we have a very accurate way of knowing the threshold of the patient, we will have a much more accurate way of specifying gain on the hearing aid. And that, of course, is many times better than simply using the audiogram determined on a 2cc coupler or 6cc coupler uh, for that particular matter. So the accuracy of the threshold determination is improved, the accuracy of the gain specification is improved, but more importantly, one very important advantage of the sensogram is it increases the reliability, it increases the way we predict the aided performance of the hearing aid, meaning how well would this hearing aid perform when it is worn by that particular patient. The other study that I would like to share with you, which I think is the most powerful thing uh, that is introduced since sliced bread uh, decades and, and centuries ago, is the use of the sound tracker, which I like to talk a little bit about now. So some of you are very familiar with the sound tracker, some of you are not. So let me start by kind of explaining to you what the sound tracker is uh, and, and where we go from there. The sound tracker is a display on the compass graph that helps us understand what is the input and what is the estimated output in the patient's ear canal with the use of our hearing aid. Okay? On this particular graph, uh, you will see the frequency displayed on the x-axis uh, and the output of, of uh, actually the sound pressure level displayed on the y-axis. You see 15 different colored bars, each one representing one of the 15 channels uh, on the hearing aid. You see um, a dotted line here. This is the sensogram of the patient. So this is the in situ threshold of the patient across each one of those uh, frequencies. The lighter color bars represent the input level measured at each channel. The darker color bar represents the gain applied to those particular channels. Okay? And of course, we've learned that input plus gain is the output of the hearing aid. So each one of these bar represents the total output of the hearing aid in each one of those 15 channels. So we have the hearing aid input, which is the lighter bar. We have the gain. We have the total output in each channel. Okay? What you also see, so, so this is, by the way, this is the instantaneous output of the hearing aid. So you see it going up and down. So we now see that output of the hearing aid changes as I'm speaking, as something is, is, is going on. What we also see is a green shaded area in some of these situations. This is the average output of the hearing aid or the average simulated output of the hearing aid across the range of sounds uh, that you can see. The upper part is the, max, uh, is, the, is the high upper level and the lower one is the lower level of that range of sound uh, that is being averaged. Now, looking at this here, you immediately see one thing, and that is you do see the output of the hearing aid, you do see the in situ threshold of the patient, which is marked by the sensogram. Some of you sitting here say, well, wait a minute, isn't that something that you have just shown me? You know, when you were talking about the real deer measurement, you were showing me the in situ threshold, you were showing me the in situ output of the hearing aid, and you were talking about the sensation level of, the he of, 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 of that frequency being the difference of the output and the threshold. Are you saying the same thing in the sound tracker? Are you saying that the output here minus the threshold of the patient is the same as the sensation level? And if that's the question you ask, you are absolutely right. 
we are actually seeing the sensation level of the patient at each one of those frequencies because it's do the same, you know, the output and then the, 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 the threshold and that of course gives us the sensation level. The question that some of you would ask is, well, yes, this is a sensation level, but is this sensation level the same as the sensation level in the real day measurement system? Because if they are the same, then we can actually say that the information on the sound tracker is the same as the information on the real gear system. It tells us if a particular sound is audible to the patient or not simply by looking at the sound tracker. And that, of course, is a very important question that we need to have answers for. So we did some studies. And the first study that we have done is to simply make sure that the input that we sent to the, sound, to the hearing aid is exactly what is reflected on the sound tracker. So we, uh, we, we put a microphone sound level meter next to the hearing aid. We measure what is the sound going into the sound level meter. And we also look at the display on the sound tracker to see what the sound tracker says. And indeed, if you look at these here using pure tone stimuli, using white noise stimuli, what we see on the sound tracker is within 1 dB of what you see on the sound level meter. And that's very precise, okay? And the reason why, and that is something that is, we didn't talk too much about, uh, but it is important to know, and the reason why we have such good correspondence is because WIDEX actually calibrates each and every microphone during the production process when the hearing aid is being assembled. And that is why we can tell you very accurately that what you see on Compass Sound Tracker is actually what the patient would, what the hearing aid sees when the sound is being measured. And that's, I think, is very, very important. The second question that you ask is, okay, so you are telling me the input is exactly what it should be. But what about the output of the hearing aid? Are they the same? Well, let's take a look. If you look at this here, let's say we have the uh, in situ threshold that we measured on the on the sensogram. If you put the in situ, if you put the hearing aid in a 711 coupler, or yeah, 711 coupler, which mimics the size of the average ear canal, you say get an, uh, a level of 85 dB. So the in situ threshold is 85 dB as measured on the sound tracker. On the other hand, if you have the hearing aid present the same sound and measured it in the ear canal, you may actually get a number that is different than 85 dB. In this case, let's say it is 90 dB, okay? So the absolute number that you can measure on the sound tracker or the sensogram may not be exactly the same as the real dear number. Okay, they say, well, that's not very good. Well, you're right, that's not very good. Let's look further. Now, that's the in situ threshold, but if you now measure the output of the hearing aid, so you send some sound to the hearing aid, you measure what is coming out of the hearing aid. Let's say you did not put in too much sound, and that's not too much amplification. So now the in situ output of the hearing aid may only be 95 dB measured in the coupler. But the same system, if you measured it with the probe mic system, measuring it from the real ear, you may see an output which is 100 dB. Now let's go back and take a look. When you are doing it with a threshold, the in situ threshold is 85 dB and the in, in, in the in, measured in the sound tracker and the in situ threshold is 90 dB in the real ear, a difference of 5 dB. If you look at the in situ output with a real external sound measured on the, cup, on the sound tracker, it's 95 dB but the real dear output is 100 dB, again a 5 dB difference. That is a constant difference between the real dear system and a coupler sound tracker system. But more importantly, if you now look at the difference between the in situ threshold and the in situ output, as measured on the sound tracker, it is 10 dB. If you look at the difference between the in C2 threshold and the in C2 output measured in the real dear system, 
again, it is 10 dB. So, in theory, the relative difference, or the difference between the in situ threshold and the in situ output, as long as they are measured on the same coupler system, okay, which the Sound Tracker 711 coupler is a coupler system, which the real ear system, the real ear canal itself, is also a coupler system, as long as the threshold and the output are measured in the same system, coupler system, you should get the same difference between the two matrices, between threshold and output. So you should see exactly the same on the sound tracker as you would in a real deer system, even though the absolute number may not be identical. And that, of course, is a very important thing. So with that theoretical thinking in mind, we say, well, let's do a study. Let's see if indeed that is true. So we conducted a study uh, a, a year ago uh, looking at the correspondence in the sensation level between the sound tracker and a real deer system. Okay, we did two real deer systems. The one I like to talk about first is the audio scan very fit system. So what we did is this. We do the sensogram, so we perform the sensogram, and at the same time we do the sensogram, we put a probe mic in a person's ear canal. So we determine what the sensogram is, and we also measure what is the output of the hearing aid at the threshold, okay, as measured on a real deer system. And then what we did with the audio scan system, we presented the international speech shape uh, noise, the ISTS signal, uh, at different levels. In this case, we are talking about the noise at 65 dB, an average conversational level. So we present that noise, we look at the sound tracker, see how much sound is coming out from the sound tracker. We, at the same time, look at it from the real deer display and see how much sound is coming out of the hearing aid measured at the ear canal. So we look at that and we calculated the difference between the output and the threshold in each one of those systems. So that is, of course, represented by the sensation level that you see here. So in this case, the blue bar represents the sound tracker sensation level. The green bar represents the audio scan sensation level. And we have four frequencies that we have tested, 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 hertz. So if you take a look, first of all, at 500 hertz, we can see that the sound tracker sensation level is around maybe 16 dB, whereas the sound tracker audio scan, uh, the, the, the sensation level on the audio scan is about 15 dB, an average difference of about 1 dB. And if you look at 1000 hertz, they are almost identical. The average sensation level is exactly the same on average, and at 2,000 hertz is about 0.2 dB difference, and at 4,000 hertz is about 0.2 dB, uh, is about 1 dB uh, difference in the sensation level. Uh, and one thing that is also very interesting to note is the spread of that sensation level, which is marked by, the, by this column here, the standard deviation uh, bar. You can see, even though the average level agrees very well, we really do not see much variation at all. And that, I think, is very, very important. It tells you how reliable, how repeatable those measures are. So on the audio scan system, we saw very good correspondence on average, and there's not much variability. What about another system? Uh, let's take a look at the other system, which is the FRI system, uh, another very popular uh, real day measurement system in the United States. So with the same normal hearing subjects, with the same kind of setup, so we measure the in-situ uh, output uh, of the sensogram and the in-situ output of the hearing aid in the real deer and, and, and so forth. So again, looking across the different frequencies, 500 hertz, there may be an average of a dB difference. 1000 hertz, there's hardly anything. Uh, about 2000 hertz, we see approximately 2 dB uh, difference on average. Uh, 4,000 hertz, we saw about 2 dB difference uh, on average. And that, I think, is very important to note because if you look at real deer measurement system by itself, it 
the average deviation that you can expect is at least 2 dB for the better clinician. So the magnitude of this deviation is certainly within the range of deviation that you see simply on a real deer system. So we can very comfortably say this, you know, at least for normal hearing people, you see very good correspondence in the sensation level shown on the sound tracker and that shown on a real deer system. Then of course, I'm sure some of you will say, well, but you just said normal hearing people, didn't you? What about hearing impaired people? I say, well, okay, 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 you got me. Let me now show you what happens to hearing impaired people uh, that we have measured. So we repeated the same thing on the audio scan system and the, uh, the, um, and the fry system, again using the same color code and so forth. Uh, so on this side, we have the audio scan system and we have on the other side uh, the fry system comparing the, 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 the sound tracker and those radio systems. The correspondence is even more strikingly similar. If you look at this here, the audio scan system at 500 hertz, 1000 hertz is almost 0.2 dB difference or less. 2000 hertz is about 1 dB uh, and about 1 dB at 4000 hertz. The same thing we can say with the other system, with the Fry system. Okay, so whether we are using normal hearing people and put a fake hearing loss in there, or whether we are using real hearing impaired people wear, wearing hearing aid with the actual ear modes and the actual venting and so forth, we are getting extremely, extremely close correspondence between what we see on the sound tracker and what we see in the real deer system on the sensation level. Okay, and that I think is very encouraging. And since we have conducted this, we say, well, having me say this is not enough. Let's have someone of authority who can repeat the same study for us. So we have contacted Dr. Michael Valente at Washington University in St. Louis uh, to do a study with the exact parameters that we have done. Uh, I'm very happy to tell you that the study is completed. We are seeing essentially the same thing as what we have seen at ORCA, you know, in ORCA USA. But I will leave it for Dr. Valente to give you the details, exactly what he found, and what his interpretation of the findings are. I think it is only fair uh, for us to do that. Okay, so some of you would say, well, okay, so that's good, but, but I see other people doing something like this. I see other people doing speech mapping, you know, that you don't have to do any real deer measurement. So are yours just as good or are they have the same capability as yours? I think to put it into context, there are a couple of things that we do that is very, very difficult. Not impossible, but very difficult for other people to mimic. One is we are very particular about the whole calibration process. You know, like I said er to you earlier, in every hearing aid that we assemble, we calibrated the microphone as we assemble them. So we know exactly what the characteristics are of those, you know, and we actually can compensate that in the display. So what you are seeing on the sound tracker is the actual, well, well not the actual, but close to actual performance of the hearing aid that you can really see because we have accounted for all those variability. And that I think is a very important thing that you should evaluate when it comes to systems like this. The other aspect of it, which I'm very proud to be part of Widex, is because of the, the details that we looked at. The other thing that we have done is we actually have an algorithm called the ISA, or the Assessment of in C2 uh, effects, uh, acoustics. And what it does, it actually measures the, 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 the gain of the hearing aid with this whole venting system, and actually able to predict fairly closely what the effective vent diameter is of that particular patient, okay? So we know what kind of leakage we see. We can actually compensate for that leakage and make all those corrections in the display. So the calibration aspect that we use, as well as the estimation of the vent effect and being able to compensate for the vent effect gives us very good estimate, you know, of the sensation level. And that's why I say, you know, that's why you see such a close correspondence between the, the sensation level on a sound tracker 
and the sensation level on a real deer system. And that's why I, th I think we are very unique, even though there might be other people doing similar things, you know, but the, 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 the devil, as they say, is in the details. And these are the details in our system. All right, so what can I conclude? I, I think it's very important uh, that you do the sound tracker, that you do the sensogram. You know, I know it takes a few more minutes to do the sensogram, you know, even though you may have audiogram information, but I think if you take that extra two minutes to do the sensogram, you would enjoy the benefit that I just talked about. You can predict the ADA threshold, you can look at the sensation level on the sound tracker without doing real day measurement and know reasonably well whether the patient can hear sounds at particular frequencies and what sounds uh, you can hear. Uh, and when you do that, when you do the sensogram and then verify with the sound tracker, you will do it right the first time. It minimizes the amount of patient visits that you would have, and that, of course, is beneficial for you as a clinician and for the patient. Um, a variable time, and again, the last thing, I cannot emphasize it enough, it really does not require any additional extent expenditure or resources. And I think that is important, especially in today's economic situations where you really want to cut any extraneous costs. And this is a good way to save costs and expand your, 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 your revenue by seeing more patients doing fewer things. And that I think is, is also very important. Um, this is all I have to say, and I want to thank you all very much for taking the time and, uh, and see you on another topic.